gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for coming to Bearcon Books for a poetry reading with our former Vermont Poet Laureate, Sydney Lee. A few, yeah, there's the crowd. <laughs> I'd like to thank Orca Media for filming tonight's event. And I'd like to let you know that you can sign up for our newsletter. There was a clipboard that got passed around um, to learn about future events. Next week, we host the Commissioner of Vermont Forests, Parks, and Recreation, Michael Snyder, for a talk on his new book, Woods Wise, An Exploration of Forests and Forestry. And that might be a nice follow-up to tonight's reading, yeah. since uh, Sydney's poetry um, features Vermont's woods and natural rural landscape. Also, for you poetry lovers, save the date for October 8th, when we host Reuben Jackson, and his new poetry collection, Scattered Clouds. And this is available here tonight at Bear Pond Books. So we're thrilled to have Sydney here. His new book, Here, is here. <laughs> it's a wonderful collection of poems about a life in awe of the world right here around us. The book is a life remembered, a life in gratitude and apology, a life in the 21st century, a life in the country, a life in close proximity to mortality, and a life in mindfulness and love. It is simply stunning in its grace, and I love the poem Spilled Milk, an apology to a daughter almost 40 years late. It really struck me as sweet and insightful. So I urge you all, if you haven't already, to pick up a copy, or two, because poetry makes a great gift, um, buy the book, support the poet, support your favorite independent bookstore. Sydney will sign books after his reading and talk tonight. Sydney Lee was Vermont Poet Laureate from 2010 to 2015. He was also the founder and for 13 years the editor of New England Review. He taught at Dartmouth, Yale, Middlebury, Wesleyan, the Vermont College MFA, and several European institutions. Winner of the Poets Prize in 1998 and a Pulitzer finalist in 2001, his work has appeared in over 60 anthologies and he co-edited the anthology Roads Taken, Contemporary Vermont Poetry, which we have here at the bookstore as well. <coughs> his poems, essays, and stories have appeared in all the major US literary quarterlies as well as The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The New Republic, Sports Illustrated, and the New York Times. We have plenty of chairs if you wanted to come on out. I like to stand up. Okay. Um, <clears throat> in addition, Lee has been awarded fellowships from the Fulbright, Rockefeller, and Guggenheim Foundations. And we're thrilled he's here. Please help me welcome Sydney Lee. <laughs> I'm going to try and project, <laughs> uh, but if you feel at any point that I ought to pick up that handheld uh, mic, don't, don't be shy about it. Uh, it's a lovely introduction. Um, I, I wish I lived closer than an hour away from because this is my favorite uh, independent bookstore. I don't know how you could find a better one. And I can't get out of this place without buying something, although my wife was taking care of that tonight, for, so I'm not obliged <laughs> anymore. But uh, I'm delighted to be, uh, to be invited, and I'll read Old Baker's dozens of poems. <clears throat> you can't stop me, so I might as well uh, forge ahead. Um, one, of our, uh, one of the audience members earlier said a very, very nice thing to me about how the first poem in this uh, book called Here at Summer's End uh, had been a bit of a bomb to her lately during some difficult time. And uh, it, uh, it's, it, I, I, the last thing on earth that I imagined my own poetry to be is prophetic. But as curious as I was putting this together, I looked at all the poems written before 2016, including this one. Uh, and saw that a lot of them had to do with an insistence on presence, physical, mental, spiritual, psychological, what have you, on here-ness. Um, and then in 2016, August, uh, I had a heart attack, which was something I hadn't predicted. Uh, 
and uh, mm -hmm. I felt fine. Indeed, I was traveling for uh, uh, training for a six-mile kayak race, thinking maybe this year I'd do the 12-mile one because I was feeling that fit. And then I got this little pinch. And then when they said you're having a heart attack at the local clinic, I said, No, that's what other people have. I mean, that's not me. <laughs> uh, I've done well on that kayak race since, so they did something right at Eastern Maine Medical Center. At all events, um, the first poem in the book is called Here at Summer's End. That birds have largely quieted may distress us. And like neglected mail, the garden's lettuce went yellow weeks back and simply dissolved. But we ought to pause before we focus on loss in a season still teeming with vegetation. No matter the month, our sense of wonder remains unless we will it to leave. Even now, the mercury flirts with 85, so it's wondrous, say, how starlings decide to convene for migration. We can watch their flocks in the roadbeds. It's a marvel as well, whatever the forces that's already started to blanch the legs of the snowshoe hares. Our longing is always for now to endure, though since the dawn of thinking, many a thinker has found death an engine of beauty. Truth is, however, our world will never go dead. Those heads of lettuce have fused with humus below, and after those starlings wing off, the juncos and titmice will show, and the ghostly hairs of winter won't be ghosts at all, but creatures with dark flesh packed onto bone under ivory hides. Coyotes will hunt them to keep alive through the ineluctable, I almost said awful, chill. And even then, the ice beads on softwood boughs may look, if we want, like permitted fruit. As the season nears or lingers or ends, an amplitude can tell us we still are subject to spells. We're here, after all. Let's chant it throughout the year, like so much bird song. We're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's a poem that uh, Samantha referred to called Spilled Milk. Um, apology to a daughter, almost 40 years late. The train lumbered out of Toronto Station. Together we headed for subarctic lakes to visit your brother at camp. Your older and only sibling then. I dreamed of northern air as our coach careened past clinkers, barrels, filthy railway sheds, Ugly as you were lovely. I ordered a spread of lunchtime stuff with, for me, some coffee, a glass of milk for you. A dozen miles would pass before you took a drink. You had a habit, almost willful, it seemed, of spilling whatever you drank and must have been afraid, oh, damn it, to reach for your glass while the dining car swayed and quivered. As for me, distracted, I was fixed on the winking waters we'd find upstream from the mess of Milky River at Trackside. In time, we escaped those outskirts, outskirts into open prairie space, and you spilled the glass, of course. I pray at least I said nothing out loud, but I have no doubt you could read my miserable thoughts. And now, if I get to hell, as I sometimes think I will if justice prevails, <laughs> precisely for things I've thought, my Hadian vision may be of your shame-ridden six-year-old face all riven by worry, which it should have been my fatherly duty to soothe, restoring what had been its beauty. Mm. My wife has a really interesting friend who uh, farms in western Massachusetts and does a lot of other things. She's a wonderful artist and photographer and naturalist. Um, and she came up one weekend while I was going to be away to uh, teach my wife and her dearest friend, uh, local friend, uh, how to make those Ukrainian eggs, you know, gorgeous works of art, it's a poem called, unoriginally, Ukrainian Egg. <clears throat> I'm off on a late se season fishing trip with the guys. We bump along in my beat up pickup laughing, our humorous adolescent, the day bone chilling. Meanwhile, her dear friend Portia and Robin, my wife, are learning from Joan here on a visit to fashion Ukrainian eggs. 
The teacher and students are certain there will really be something to see. The eggs, I mean. After our umpteenth idiot joke obscene, I feel some sadness rise up in me, like one a cello might summon. That trio of women back home will be chuckling too, I suspect, though their jokes will remain a lot less crude, no doubt, than the ones we're telling. But the women will also be serious, each intending, and I'm sure they will, to make objects of beauty and grace. But why would that cause this weeping response to rise? Vain, male, I turn my face aside. To call those women cute is absurd. They're not at all a group that anyone would patronize. It's perhaps that I'm thinking, and not for the very first time, how much in my life I would, if I could, revise. Like the way my grade school posse of punks and clowns would scoff when the girls turned to projects all their own. Some wore pants under dresses against the cold. They'd play secretary, nurse, or laughably bold, even cops or firefighters, pilots, cowboys, soldiers. And we, we mocked them, we witless, unschooled fools, sure of ourselves, sure that we'd prevail in that age before we helped to raise our daughters. My, uh, my father was a commander of uh, so-called colored troops in the segregated army in World War II. Uh, some of the few African-American troops to be at Omaha Beach, 70% of them killed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, I probably, nine out of 10 people under 60 don't realize that the ar army was segregated in that way uh, until <clears throat> after the war and President Truman integrated them. At any rate, uh, I was, uh, came that close from being uh, born in Alabama, where the hurricane recently ravaged. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but something happened that, that impelled my mother to come north to Pennsylvania, where I was born. It's called the Owl and I. Once the Jim Crack Cross got burned on our lawn, my mother took off back north to have me. My father was stationed in Gadsden, Alabama before the Second Great War, commander of so-called colored troops, and he'd invited a few of his men inside the house, it seems. A radical thing indeed, just then in the heart of Jim Crow Dixie. So my mother escaped giving birth down there, though I don't have any idea why I'd think of this, which near to her death she spoke of so many years after. Why now? on watching a barred owl glide to a hemlock gone dark at sundown. Everything else as well going dark around me, here where I stand. Once at midnight, she thought she'd heard a whoop of human anguish and wondered whether some soldier were being lynched outside. My father went for a look but found nothing. My lifelong relations with my mother were vexed, I now suspect, in part because between us two, with a lot in common. Jews were being crammed into cattle cars then, but for Dad and those troops, the evil in Europe lay several months ahead. Still, real or imagined, that cry of mortal misery stuck with Mother, though no signs of nearby violence turned up next morning. The company came on mass to mess, shit on a shingle, as the GI said, dried beef on toast. So life went on, at least for a while more or less. It ought to bring comfort that I'm where I am, aging but safe, my kin constantly swelling as sons and daughters produce their sons and daughters. And winter so harsh this year, giving way at last to spring, the snowdrops glinting, the freshets making their evanescent cascades through the woods. I recall how my mother loved this season. Why then this lonely sensation? It feels that I'm in some pitch black tunnel and won't get out again. That this, as the saying goes, is it. That all I'll have it in the end. Of course, there can't be anything to it. It's a sorrowful eight note anthem of that single owl. The sound just now having reached my vexed old head. Though I'd be foolish to think that song was addressed to anyone human.
I have obviously misrecorded. Oh, 31, not 21. My grandmother always said there was less suffering when the mind went first. Uh, <coughs> I don't seem to be suffering so maybe. <laughs> this is called Chimera. The eagle's wings were angled in a stoop that seemed almost languid. And yet, in an eye blank, it flew past the window and out of view. For me, now in my 70s, it can feel as if everybody were gone, or about to be gone. For instance, my brother-in-law, dead some time now, young. I loved him for years and years. Parents, a sibling, peers. The great creature is cutting across the window less sight than loss. As if flight had exemplified the concept brevity. And the bird were conscious of me, and consciousness were crucial in you, or me, or an eagle. I have many friends here who will assure you that I'm lots of fun in real life. <laughs> well, I'm called I Impune a Victorian. It has an epigraph from uh, William Makepeace Thackeray. There are a thousand thoughts lying within a man that he does not know till he takes up a pen to write. Or within a woman. Or maybe old Thackeray was delusionary, yearning to believe that simply by being a writer he could write and thoughts would just show up. <laughs> it's been too long since I read about his Becky Sharp and others to evaluate whether in fact they do arrive in his famous Vanity Fair or elsewhere in the eminent Victorian's work. Maybe he's only vain. But I also yearned to believe that reading that passage somewhere, I jotted it down because somehow its words spoke to something inside me. That is, now that I'm taking up the pen's contemporary equivalent, now that I'm typing, I hope my scribbles will appear perhaps not as thought, perhaps precisely, but as subject or theme that will ring the least bit true. At least I can dream so. Or. On a better day, if you'll forgive my presumption, they may even instruct. How long, however, dear William, must I keep on composing these lines without deliberation before those thoughts you speak of supervene? I'd settle for one. <laughs> <clears throat> it's exacting to keep all this up, dimly expecting some higher level of mental engagement as, meanwhile, the feeder by our window seem teams with the same old delightful birds of our winters. Redpole, pine siskin, minuscule brown creeper, nuthatch, the usual horde of chickadees, a tufted titmouse, hairy and downy woodpeckers, peckers, and now and again to the more alert bird's consternation and mine, though I confess its beauty also thrills me, a sharp shinned hawk fixed on murder. It skulks in the high bare limbs of that paper birch until it stoops upon some blithe little victim, or more curiously, merely perches there, declining to dive and to wreak its havoc. Your comments have made a little peace in my mind, Mr. Baked Peace. I took you at your word, and here I am, less far along Thoughts Avenue than I was at the start. <laughs> I've been pressing and prosing ahead for five desultory stanzas, and I conclude that since I have to move forward, since I have to move toward conclusion, that like so much of life in the way I have known it, all but a tiny part of the process has consisted of waiting without a clue. <laughs> Not that there isn't a whole array of worse concerns to fret about than this amusement. I haven't yet gone down to the village store to fetch the newspaper, doubtless full of examples of such worse things. But meanwhile, look at these birds, so vivid, brilliant, who etch their small but eloquent marks upon the snow, even the ones without a clue they're close to death. Many, many years ago, I was sitting in a canoe on West Grand Lake in Washington, Maine, watching an entire peninsula uh, burn. Uh, and it burned. Back. Things have changed. We don't have so many forest fires in the East anymore. Better surveillance, better firefighting equipment. <coughs> but in those days, uh, often these uh, fires would erupt, and then they would burn, essentially, until the snow came. They'd, creep underground along the mulch and then come up again. 
uh, one of my favorite poet from the local town of Seventy up there, George MacArthur, who was, would entertain you a lot more than I if he were here as an old logger. And uh, it was Depression times, and uh, he told me that he uh, he worked as a fire watchman uh, one summer. <laughs> he said, uh, he says I, I was loafing. I didn't have nothing to do. He says, I had a little jug of coal oil. I kept that damn thing going all summer long. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, uh, and I, I reflected on that, uh, remembering that, and, uh, and then I had a, a, a dream. I don't usually like to write about dreams because they're usually boring. I hope this one is not. This poem is called Fire and it's a Jewel. Eighty-foot hemlock, spruce, fir, pine. They kept lifting off their stumps like so many rockets, smoke trail and all. And I beheld the fire across lake from where I drifted. I'd been plumbing the water for fish when my eyes were lifted. Fifty years later, I still recall my thoughts, and I felt that to think them was more than odd. I was glad I had faculties to behold the hill's astonishing orange heat as it flared, flared to white with each explosion. Then the whole of that conflagration bending toward Earth, a horizontal wall, a monolith that somehow tore downhill in a sudden fury of wind. It was gorgeous. Several hours would go by till I learned Earl Bailey was forced to fly as quickly as he could on his dozer down from the ridge right into Farm Cove. He just had to take the loss. It was that or burn. Donald Chambers, wielding an ax in his turn with a makeshift crew, collapsed from labor and heat. Paul, the storekeeper, dragged him away by his feet. I knew Don Sadler just a few more years. He and Earl and Paul, good, honest men. I can't account for dreams like the one of last night when I watched that fire again. In what seemed again pure quiet, serene, the same jetliner as years ago crossed high, the same scent rose, torched needles, caustic smoke, the same evil roar came on as I rocked in the same canoe, the waves still slapping its hull. In an hour, five decades back, the length of that ridge, burn, ridge line turned the color of onyx. The latest of my wife's birthdays will soon be upon us. Is that why the dream passed smoothly into the next one? I saw precisely a beautiful onyx stone hung on her breast from a slip of chain. I never dreamt of such a woman as that hillside blackened. Wouldn't need her for years. Today. I drove to a jewelry shop as if still dreaming, 300 miles to the west of that little mountain. I bought the necklace and I felt some fire in my being, my old version of one that kindled, kindled in that old autumn, which has, for a long time, underground kept burning. poem called Auction. If I passed their Swayback's house on a summer day, and like anyone in town, I'd hear Fred scraping at his cherished rosewood fiddle, which is now just char. Hazel would be singing no, matter, no better than her husband played. Neither one cared. They made their music for fun, and I made fun of them both. Then came fire. I feel odd guilt to consider their frailty. And I wonder, what am I here to see? Out of nowhere, I think of an early love of how often I laughed at her dreams of being a painter, at what she hoped but, hoped but was simply unable to save with shapes on canvas and colors. Of course, she left me. My life has been more capacious than I deserve, but in those days, how lost kept, her loss kept scorching my soul. I was all but speechless. She later died of an illness, horribly young. I reflect that after her fire from me had cooled and soon, in fact, simply guttered, I sometimes wished catastrophe would strike her. Fred and Hazel reduced to cinder. That was a shock and a shame. But more vanished, too, some even beforehand. The children they bred in that old house had moved off years back though they've come today to reap what little they may. Their son and two daughters are here. 
Unlike the initial silverware, the tunes we mocked, the crude watercolor spread wrought of sunsets, snowstorms, birds, old barns, and deer. Hazel's antimacassars, black wisps on blackened couch and chair. Old photographs of his parents and hers, long gone, now gone again. And again, I'm thinking of goneness, the way my lover would dip the brush in paint and scowl as if in pain. Here is the little remains to sell, it's absurd. And the auctioneer stumbles, searching for words. The people, this, this will get a sense of the mean age of my audience. How many people in the room remember Studebakers? Yeah. They grow old with me. Uh, we used to call them string beans. And I got to tell this story about the Studebaker. Not that it has anything to do with the poem. But I was saying earlier to my friend George Thomas that, you know, some people sneeze when there's ragweed. I tell stories when something reminds me like a Studebaker. When I was a kid, I'll ask you again, maybe, I, I don't know if anybody ever saw a film called Weed Geordie. It was about a Highland, Highland Shepherd who was prepping for the, uh, for the Highland Games, and he was what we used to call it throwing the hammer, you know, big old sledgehammer. And I, I just thought that was the coolest motion, and he won, and he got the girl and everything. And so I get home, fat little 13-year-old, stumble into the shed, get my dad's sledgehammer out, and I, and I throw it about from, from me to Scooter over and over again. One last try. And I don't know what happened. But I, this thing took off. <laughs> and there was a, a white picket fence in front of our lawn and a Studebaker coming down the road. Oh, no. And it was all like in slow motion. I watched it. <laughs> and bang, right on the roof. Thank God, not the windshield, right? This guy pulled off the <laughs> Just as my father pulled in from the And uh, he came over. He was the mildest of men. He said, you get in the house. <laughs> and then some negotiation went on. That was the last thing. So then I came back into the house. My father said, what in the world were you doing? And he started to crack up. <laughs> Thank God my mother was somewhere else or had been beaten to a pulp. But uh, at any rate, that has nothing to do with this one. But I, my favorite <laughs> uh, This is called Stick Season. And I, I wrote it after hearing uh, our friend Peter Gilbert, then of the Vermont Humanities Council, do a piece on VPR about stick season in mid-November <laughs> or what have you. And uh, I got thinking on how much I like that time of year, which is counterintuitive to some of you, perhaps. But anyway, stick season. The one that precedes my season is the one that always shows on this quaint calendar photograph. The one that brings the tourists to scenes that are glorious, granted, exorbitant on the side hills. Most of the leaves incandescent, drifting or plunging downward, so scuttle along the roadbeds like little creatures reluctant to be seen, yet warning us to notice them after all. But give me this, middle of November, season of sticks, a stubborn oak and beech leaves, umber and dun, which rattle in gusts that smell so elemental they stab your heart. The trees, the other unclothed ones, are standing there, gaunt but dignified, and you can look straight past them. The contours of the mountains, stark perhaps, but lovely, and their apparent constancy. That gap-toothed barn houses space alone since its owner died. Do you remember Studebakers? That's one over there, a pickup truck, flat-footed among the sumacs. Painted green way back, these days, it has taken the hue of these later leaves I love. Old age has changed the mountains, too. They're rounder now than once, shaped so by the eons. Everything's for a time. Um, I had a colleague at the Vermont College, now Vermont College of the Fine Arts, uh, named Jack Myers. I died a few years ago. And Jack uh, was a Jewish boy from the North Shore of Boston. Uh, and, uh, and yet he ended up teaching at the uh, Southern Methodist University uh, 
all his life and living in Dallas, but he never lost his love of the ocean, so that after he died of cancer, his wife uh, uh, discovered a, a directive that he wanted his ashes scattered in as many oceans as she could manage to do. And she's been very uh, diligent about that. I think she's done five of the seven seas. I was there for the Atlantic uh, the spreading of the ashes off a of jetty in, uh, in Winthrop, Massachusetts. Uh, that was the first stop. And uh, this is a poem called Dark Chord, Remembering Jack Myers, 2011. Some hours before I drove here, I slipped a DVD of Mingus in Europe into the player. And there he was on bass, with Eric Dolphy on alto and bass clarinet, Jackie Byron on keyboard. Danny Richmond drums, Johnny Colson trumpet, and Clifford Jordan tenor. They looked so young and strong. They were so gifted, and I was here on a jetty above the Atlantic, one of several friends and family gathered to scatter the ashes of Jack, our poet, into the waves. Poor Eric Dolphy died within months of that tour in 64, while I finished up my chaotic college years. I'd been no genius. I'd had so little to offer the world, but here I was now. A pair of cormorants skimmed quickly by while two young lovers embraced the way they're supposed to embrace on the beach. And I saw the moon rise full. All was perfect, it seemed, except that Jack wasn't with us. Which may have accounted for the sound, not the intricate magic of that Mingus band I heard, nor a line or a stance from Jack's mournful, witty poems. Nor was it the cry of seabirds, and if Wagner didn't drive me almost mad, or maybe because he does, I'd have said that the chord was a dark Wagnerian one. As it played, it washed all over me, as surf does a rocky shore. Some aunt or cousin that evening would show me a picture of Jack at 17 right here in Winthrop, Massachusetts, sitting, cocky and proud. On a motorcycle, handsome and frank, and it was oddly as though I somehow heard that photograph too. Jack sounded so young. His engine rumbled while he said something in that Boston brogue he never lost. A boyhood friend had a word or two to say as well, but broke down before he could finish. I'll miss him terribly, said Mark, sweet mutual friend, and terrible it might be. So when I heard the chord again, it reminded me, as I fought for balance on those rough and slippery rocks, because I was old Jack's age exactly, damn it. I was older than those masters of jazz holding forth in Europe, vibrant alive, back in the year when I was only 21. The chord reminded me, as I noted the cormorants winging back and the lovers walking back, and the moon, and noted the ocean breeze of good Jack's winter childhood, and thought I could be noting all this idly, as believe me, in this moment I'd love to have done. The dark chord reminded me, something big has been shaping up for years and years, and now, you know, old man, it's for all of us here, including you. <clears throat> I, I apologize. I had this carpal tunnel operation, and I don't have any feeling back in my fingers yet, as I hope I do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, all right. Close, coming to a close now, I always say that uh, when I gave my first poetry reading way back in the early 70s, I was just so nervous I, could, I couldn't even describe it now. Uh, in my best poem, I couldn't describe it. Uh, but the poet Richard Hugo had been very nice to me uh, when I was starting out. And he was out in Seattle, but I called him up. And I, I confessed I'm so... I'm so nervous. And Dick had a great big head with wrinkles not normally found in nature on it. It looked, it looked like, uh, well, perhaps on a St. Bernard. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, well, there's a secret to it, kid. I said, oh, good. What is it? He said, never let a poetry reading exceed in length an episode, a single episode of Kojak. <laughs> When I get to about half an hour, I, I see this big wrinkled head and this bald one on the other shoulder, and I, I become apprehensive. Um, the poem called News Comes Third. 
Oh, these guilty pleasures, if that's what I really should call them. I buy the local paper and my usual cup of store coffee, then drive back home and sit, ignoring whatever may be transpiring outside the window. Squall of a spring tom turkey calling his hens, the contrails of planes on their way to Europe, Tokyo, Rio, Paris, who knows. I sip from the cup and turn first, things to letter, turn first thing to letters, primarily to see just what might annoy me today. <laughs> If it's someone fussing over an issue like water rates in a small town near or far whose fortune or misfortune I have no personal stake in, I go right ahead to the sports. I check how my teams are doing. That is, if I haven't spent the preceding evening's hours watching games on TV. What the hell? I'm retired, so leave me alone. <laughs> my wife was right upstairs, likely watching stuff of her own, like some period thing from Great Britain which would lull me to sleep in an instant. <laughs> No, give me two on and two out in the bottom of the ninth. An impossible game-clinching shot in overtime, a field goal from 50 yards out. I don't care if some lady whines in her letter, how the clerk in a local shop, when she asked him for help, said, forget it, I'm busy. <laughs> that woman claims that people were kinder once. But I bet that complaint was heard when people still lived in Cape. Don't tell me my wife and I should hone our communication. We know each other like twins. We've been lovers for almost four decades. Can you tell me you're doing better? <laughs> a train shakes the valley each morning while I'm feeding my sports addiction. I don't mind that sound far away. News comes third, and it seems these days it's always a mess. There I go sounding myself like that woman I just made fun of. Another exotic disease, another, another IED. A register man shot dead by someone less nice than the lady upset by a rude clerk's behavior. I go back and skim through recaps, never mind if I've seen the game, above all one that we've won. But for me to say we is absurd, and don't think I don't know it. I'm sure there's not one player who'd give me the time of day. Though I've never met her, I don't like to think of that letter writer because I'll start making a picture, her husband dead in the Gulf. Are kids all disappointments or worse, or drugs and jail, or both? She stares through tears out her shitbox apartment window. While I read such letters and fume or check the stats and the box scores, I keep my eyes off the photos to go with the news, which comes third. <laughs> now a poem that I like to read. And that my wife doesn't particularly like me to read. Um, told my wife back. It's a little touch of the erotic in here, even at my age, uh, though not enough to uh, warrant censorship or <laughs> even perhaps to offend uh, Mike Pence. <laughs> oh. uh, but you know, I, I took up the, this uh, sport of flat water kayak racing uh, when I was probably 16 and couldn't, without using the word, it was always to be used loosely in my case, couldn't run anymore, my knees were, wouldn't take it. Uh, and we live very close to the Connecticut River, so it's, it's ideal for me, there's no impact, it's close, it's a good workout. And sometimes, uh, sometimes, uh, this, this remembers a time when, when my wife and I were in an open canoe just doing something much more sane, just drifting down and seeing what we could see. She in the bow and I in the stern, weight being what it is. And ability. <clears throat> it's called my wife's back. All naked but for a strap that traps my gaze as we paddle the as we paddle. The dear familiar nubs of spine bone punctuating that sun warm swath. The slender muscles that trouble the same sweet surface. We've watched and smiled as green herons flushed and hopped ahead at every bend. And we've looked up at a red tail, tracing open script on a sky so clear and deep we might believe it's autumn, no matter it's August still. Another fall will be on us before we know it. Of course we adore that commotion of color, but it seems to come again as soon as it's gone away. They all do now. We're neither young anymore, to put matters plainly. My love for you over 40 years extends in all directions just now to your back as we drift and paddle down the tranquil Connecticut River. We've seen a mink scratch fleas out on a mudflat. We've seen an osprey start to die, but seeing us think better of it. 
Two Phoebes wagged on an ash limb. Your torso is long. I can't see your legs, but they're longer, I know. Phoebe, Osprey, Heron, Hawk, marvels under Black Mountain. But I'm fixed on your back, indifferent to other wonders. Bright minnows that flared in the shallows the gleam off that poor mink's coat. Even the fleas in its fur, the various birds, the lust of creatures just to survive. But I watch your back. Never have I wished more not to die. Mm. Oh. <coughs> and finally, the bookend um, here poem, began with here at Summer's End. And if I can make my fingers work, I will go to a poem called Here Itself. It's got an inscription from the Eastern Maine Medical Center of Patients Report, 8-21-2016. The eluting stent placed in occluded right coronary artery of otherwise fit and pleasant 73-year-old male, <laughs> former poet laureate of Vermont. Robin <clears throat> occasionally will quote the, the pleasant part, but <laughs> not being particularly pleasant. Uh, yeah, fit and pleasant, my, you know what? <laughs> Here itself. I had a heart attack. It's something I kept on thinking one hears from others. In search of dazzling revelation, I'd wandered blind through the world, had begun to see as much, having approached Paul's barber shop, for instance, down the same asphalt alley and the same old hard scrabble hamlet, and through the same old waiting room with those copies, unchanging, of guns and ammo, popular mechanics, what have you. I contemplated the ancient jug of Lucky Tiger. Paul's horseshoe pitching trophies, the snapshot curling around its tacks of the 350 pound bear at his feeder. And Paul and myself, right there in the mirror, as ever. It's 30 years and more he's been cutting my hair as it's dwindled. Three full decades of identical questions when he's nearing the finish. What a dry. Shall I do the eyebrows? <laughs> a little more off the top? Trim the ears? Of course, he knows the answers. It's the right is all, and a very comfort. Wonder lies in minuscule things. I'm here. There's a tough, late, solitary dahlia in our flower garden. A hooded meganza drake is grating like a rusted hinge from our pond. I notice these things as it seems to me now I haven't before. I felt no fear, just wistfulness for wife, children, grandchildren, friends. I had a dress rehearsal for death, but no, no terror. Strapped in a gurney, I went off to visit the wonderful isness of was, <laughs> the isness of how forever. An Indian summer paddle trip on my beloved Connecticut River, reflected below, crows across the water to disappear behind a scrim of yellow leaves, cottonwood, silver maple. I can't quite describe it, but here I am to see it. I push through the windrows of the lustrous fall foliage on the surface. There, above the village steeple, a cloud resembling nothing, only itself. Not chastity, not purity, cotton, whipped cream, itself. Who'd want it other? I'm here to see it, itself, entire. Thank you.